Well, welcome everybody. Uh, we are part of a, of a uh, team here for our food assessment grant, and that's funded through the First Nations uh, program. And Seneca Scott and I are on that team, and Brian in the back. In Kitty Land. Kitty uh, Land. <laughs> Sorry, we took your table up here. <laughs> we are already seeing That's the best some. That's agenda we've ever had. Oh, <laughs> we are already seeing some amazing results from our food assessment survey, and um, we really look forward to sharing that in the near future, so that you can get an idea of the snapshot of our community. Um, we're also working very hand in hand, um, thanks to Brian and his planning department. Uh, we have a, 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 a Pawnee Sea Preservation Project is working with the drive very close this year, more so than ever. Um, Brian is an amazing planner, and uh, my nickname for him is uh, Favorite. And the reason I call him favorite all the time is because he he really is the guy that's going to put all this planning in place. Um, and he's uh, looking at all the different partnerships, and he has a mammoth amount to do to plan the agriculture and the ranching uh, program. And with that, our team felt like uh, the best person to really give a, a good scenario about how that works is right here in our midst. He's one of he's our second year um, grower for the Pawnee Seed Preservation Project, and uh, we have some growers here uh, this year with uh, blue corn also, and um, from Randy, and and then we have the Taro Garden. Who, you know, it's always been very helpful, but it's nice. We have 17 gardens in Nebraska, and we are so proud to present our very first farmer. You know, so that's that's kind of one of the transitions we want to make is is be is to go from gardener status to farmer. And so with that, I'd just like to welcome Dale to Pawnee, Oklahoma again. He did come and meet with our Charles in the past, who, who gave the green light for Dale to, to do his thing. And um, so we're real happy to have Dale. And thank you, Dale, for, for coming all this way and bringing 140 bushels of blue corn. I'll pace back and forth and look like a crazy man up here and spew out a million different things at a time. When we get all done, you can ask all the questions. I'll, I'll at least hit on a few things as we go through here. I'm Del Fike, uh, Fike Cal Company Grace Master Genetics, um, in our location. It's 1869 in Nebraska. That's where our connection to the Pawnee people uh, came. They actually helped my family in the winter of 1869 and 1870 uh, when the dumb Germans were freezing on top of the hill and they saw this village down below. Upon the people, and they gave them food and helped them figure out a few things. So I've been indebted to the to the Pawnee people, I guess, ever since that time, and that's why I want to do everything I can to help you guys um, you know, with what you're doing. Uh, I bring a pretty comprehensive type program of change and hope, and all this good stuff all connected to the soil. So um, I've never used one of these fancy clickers. Here we go. That's my grandpa, Adolf Fike. My grandfather, when he was, uh, when he got out of school, when they told him not to come back to school anymore, he got a job in Montana on the Crow Reservation as a, as a government trapper. He learned to despise the government and love the Crow people. And uh, so I've, I've got to hear uh, so many different things about so many great Native people through my, my grandfather over the years. That's a picture. The fight man always rode a white horse, and, and he was treated the form in that picture anyway. And I think that was from 1959 on a, on a ranch that he owned out in, in Wyoming. So. This is one of my favorite sayings, we do not own the land 
land owns us, and when we become one with the soil again, then a lot of things start getting corrected. We're all of a varying base. Um, your people's, my people's, are all the same in, in, in all this. The agrarian base has been lost. I mean, a farmer, a farmer doesn't even really touch the soil. Think about how they dump the seed in the planter, and they get the tractor, and they go across the field. Uh, you know, they've lost that connection, that field to that soil. When you get that back, and our journey has been pretty amazing in how we've, how we've done all that amazing, crazy, however you want to look at it, but our connection back to the soil has, has been very spiritual for me. Um, it's certainly my calling now in what I want to do. Do what you can with what you have, where you are. That's my theory. Um, we're in the dryland hills. Um, a lot of small fields, a lot of pastures, things like that. Four miles west of us is where the aquifer starts. That turns black, and they have you know big corn yields and all this stuff. And, and uh, the living was a lot different than me down in the hills doing what what we're doing. It's a uh, this is actually a picture out of my garden. We'll talk about garden. We'll talk about philosophy. We'll talk about soil. We'll talk about society. Whatever. I'll just throw it all out there, crazy stuff like I do. Picture of uh, squash blooming in the garden in my backyard. And, uh, you know, it's it's an inspiration when you can be in that garden and see those things growing. So, the Graze Master story. Um, 1984, my family switched our registered Hereford operation to a uh, composite operation. And we started to build and play around with different breeds of cattle. And that's where we're at today. It's kind of a culmination. We don't have many black ones anymore. Everything's solid red. But it's a four breed composite with Burford, Red Angus, uh, Semitol, and Obrak. And that's what we call Graze Masters. And we trademarked that two or three years ago as one of the few breeds that's, a, that's an American breed that's been trademarked. I think there's five or six. Also, on this that's my mom's house in the back, so just the corner of the place, but uh, turning a lot of farm ground back to pasture, doing cool things like that. Fifteen years ago, I was farming 7,000 acres, almost 100 miles from point A to point B. So, uh, yeah, that was a lot of work, a lot of foolishness, a lot of being disconnected to the soil, to the family, and to the community, because all we were doing was running around. So we had become uh, friends with our captors. So the guy that was selling us the inputs, the new machinery, chemicals, the seed, the banker that was getting all this interest money, and the U.S. government with the, the big direct payments and stuff they were giving us, it's a Stockholm Syndrome, I'm friends with our captors. And uh, I give a whole talk on that, uh, usually to straight farm groups, they don't think it's real funny, and most of them look like they want to hunt me down. But by the end of the deal, they're like, that's exactly what we're at. How can we change? I was there, so uh, 1987, we started no-till in that whole process where, we're, where we didn't work the ground anymore. And then a few years later, we started to use cover crops and incorporate animal impact and things like that. Uh, to, to start to really improve the soil. Our operation now is less than 700 acres. And we're 70% more profitable than we were at 7,000. We had one employee that was half time back in the day when we were doing all that. And now we have four full time families working that. And that will continue to, as we can see, different endeavors so we can bring people in that, that I'm not a specialist in anything. I just want to provide an opportunity for people to do what they want to do and reconnect with the land. So, that's our logo. We're even doing some hogs and some chickens now. We, we have a, a neighbor couple that's doing our honeybee operation. Um, they're doing chickens, helping with the park side, bringing on a person to just do the, uh, the cattle deal now since I'm gone a lot. and. Uh, where we're at now, today, we'll, we won't be even that way tomorrow. Uh, if we're not changing every 20 minutes, 
we're not doing it right. My motto every morning when I talk to everybody is we're not making mistakes fast enough around here. We're not trying enough new things. We're not trying to be innovative. Not innovative like, you know, GPS and hands-on, hands-off technology and stuff like that. Stuff that really matters. You know, looking at high tunnels for greenhouses, looking at other operations, some permaculture, some aquaculture, some, we've got an upright silo that Deb knows is my, I stare at it every day from, of course, a different time of agriculture when they said you had to, had to do all that, my dad put that up, but it's a 60 foot cement structure that I would love to have somebody do something in, if it's, if it's uh, permaculture or aquaculture, anything. Raising the world's largest tomato. I believe that's 55 feet tall. I just read in England. And it could be the world's largest compost. Yeah, <laughs> it could be the world's largest something, and that's what I wanted. So I'm trying to find that person that can do that. So. <laughs> You're kind of very photogenic, by the way. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's one of those pictures that you probably won't get them to line up like that ever again. But. So I have. My whole deal was I was a cow guy. My dad was in the cattle business. All the, uh, our family was in the livestock business. My great great grandfather when he got there traded livestock to people. Cows have always been where we made our money off of, or at least kept us in groceries. So that was always my lifelong quest: is to build the most accountable cow on earth. That's all I want. That's the kind of goals I shoot for: the most accountable cow on earth. And, we're getting close. Our cows, they have to breed in 42 days. Um, we do not touch our cows. They don't get vaccinations anymore. They're 100% grazing all the time. This has happened in the last five or 10 years coming out of a very commercial scenario where they were in a dirty feedlot, tons of vaccine, not healthy calves, all this kind of stuff. So um, we're going in the right direction. We know we are because our cattle are healthier, we're healthier, and the soils improving. So uh, we used to be straight bred people. Uh, now we're all composite. I, I just the only use for anything straight bred is to make a crossbred is to have that heterosis, that, that hybrid vigor. Uh, cows last longer, calves easier, meats better, you name it. Um, but yeah, we fed cattle at the feedlot. The conventional feeding to nature is fundamentals. We uh, we've got these cattle, so they are accountable to all that, and it's beautiful to see. Those are. Two uh, Grace Master bull cows. They sold to a repeat buyer that's bought bulls for me for about 30 years and uh, actually uh, just went four miles west of me. So um, it's, it's beautiful to, to see those cattle develop like that. At one time in my illustrious conventional ag career, and we'll get to garden stuff. You guys don't, I just have to have the roundabout way to get all, all that's said. Uh, I spent $1.1 million per year on equipment payments. $1.1 million per year. We own $40,000 worth of equipment now, and it's all paid for. That's our equipment. That's our fertilizers. That's our, our bailing mechanism. That's everything right there. So through Johan Zeitzman in Zimbabwe in the last three or four years, we've started use an ultra high density grazing scenario where we move cattle once or twice a day. So these cattle run small strips. We mimic the bison in the fact that it's a large amount in a short area for a, a very short period of time, and then we move them off. So the manure and urine alone from condensing those, each cow will deposit roughly 75 pounds of manure and urine per cow per day. So that's pretty cool. So my group of core cows that I have at home which are kind of the elite cows, I have other people run some too, but I've got 65 animal units. They put on roughly 1.8 million pounds of free nutrients, free fertilizer. You can down some, you graze them where you want, you build soil. The soil, all the soil across the country is depleted. Um, if someone says, you know, that that's not true, they haven't been out, they haven't dug around, they haven't got to see it, you know, civilizations have, have, uh, have risen and fallen from the depletion of soil, and that's where we're at now. This was our blue corn field before the storm. We had three acres. This is in a field 
that has been cover crops in large animal impact for a decade. So the organic matter in a lot of soil in the United States is around 2%, the native prairie was around 8%. Well, this was 2.6% a decade ago, and it's 6.9% organic matter in a decade. We can build soil faster than anyone thinks, but you need the animals. Huge cover crop field, cover crop spring and fall, to get it to the point where it calls for absolutely nothing. It's balanced, completely balanced. It will take in over 13 inches of water in one hour, so that's half of our rainfall it will hold. We will not wash out, we will not go down the creek, we will not go to the Gulf of Mexico, all that good stuff. But that was a beautiful field. It was uh, it looked looked a little different than that the other day, didn't it? Was a little bit, yeah. But we still got good corn. So it's a blessing. It's my cousin and his uh, his son that helped plant the Pawnee blue corn. Um, I, I can damn all that machinery and it costs too much and all that, but when, when I don't have to pay for it, they just come over and do it. It's amazing. So they were a big part of this too. And uh, they donated their time and they donated a lot of the stuff we, we did to it. And, uh, and they're looking forward to next year's. Uh, cover crops in the garden. I always use cover crops every fall in the garden. This is a new patch of, of ground that we actually we killed off the, the grass and stuff with some vinegar solution. And then we come in and we plant a pumpkin, some squash, uh, forage sorghum, some regular milo, and sun hemp with the thoughts of it's going to break through that hard pan. And we're going to put a lot of uh, nutrients back in there. We're going to fix a lot of nitrogen. So that's right in my backyard. So when people drive by, it's like I've got that growing 10 feet from my house. And they're like, that guy's totally lost it now. He's running cow feet right next to the house. All lawns should be gardens, by the way. We shouldn't have lawns. It just makes sense. We could, yeah. we could feed it. Yeah. Everything. Every little waste of time. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So my garden, my garden is a crazy scenario of everything planted on top of each other to try to maximize how they how they complement each other when they live you know, when they're living and when they're dying it's decomposing um, it actually my garden blew my gate open so I couldn't shut it anymore it got so thick that um, yeah that's a good sign so we usually plant cover crops like I said in the fall in that garden last year in that picture to the to the far end there that was all hairy vetch a lagoon that fixes a ton of nitrogen and then we just went in and sprayed it uh, with some vinegar solution then it killed it it went flat um, you don't make rows in that because you have a ton of trash so it's like back in the old school poking it with a stick putting one seed in at the time it's like that so sorghum and angrass is my go-to uh, crop for breaking up compaction forage sorghum is used a lot too um, big roots that go down a long ways. They're a pretty good size, so when they dry, when they die and start to decompose, that water has a perfect spot to go down. It makes great cow feed. Um, you know, there's people making syrup out of it again, things like that. And everything, you have to remember, everything has been done before, or we're doing nothing new. This is all cyclical. Cover crops have been around forever. You know, gardens have been around forever, planting techniques, Everything, it was, it was perfected by nature, we screwed it up, and now we're trying to get it back. This is actually where next year's Pawnee Corn will go if, if they want us to do it again. This is uh, right across the road from where we, we have this crop. And that is cow peas, Pawnee forage sorghum, and hairy vetch. And Deb was asking if I had a picture when they were there Sunday. It's about 12 feet tall now, the forage sorghum and the, the cow peas are, are probably four feet, five feet tall. So we'll go in and we'll, who's asking? Somebody's asking about crimping the, the cover crops. We'll go in after the cows graze on that this fall with a crimper right ahead of the planter next year and make a map. So we'll not have to put any herbicides on, nothing for weeds, because we're gonna we're gonna put that mat down 
we're going to hold that moisture in, and we're not going to have any weeds come through that path. So that was that's our plan anyway. It's been working pretty well for about the last ten years. You were talking about beets and perfect habitat. This is the perfect perfect habitat. So this is a new stand of barley, alfalfa, Shoshone sand coin, and turnips. The sand coin is the absolute must for bees. So that is a legume. It's a beautiful flower. If cattle won't blow it off of it like they do alfalfa, but bees get a huge pop, it is the best honey. If you if you Google sand coin and bees, it's just insane. I mean, and that's the honey that we're raising is is. Uh, very much uh, same thing. Yeah, yeah, it's very indicative of the, the, the same point and how it, how it works. So the same point, you can't really see in that picture, but it's going to look a lot like hairy vetch when it's small and then it's fairly tall. So I've got some on my phone. It's a picture my wife took a few years ago when we were checking cattle. And that's pretty true. We have to keep looking back, you know, and we can't have that that tunnel vision on on what we're doing and it, there's there's presentations you know i use that as making ends meet <laughs> <laughs> this is how we make ends meet you have a fight cow company and um this picture's been used all over the country i don't know how many people have grabbed it and and uh and i think you got a director working with your cows that yeah our culture director well and then we take a camera with us every day yeah so we never miss an opportunity you know, because oh. the day you leave your camera at home is the day that great, like those two bull calves lining up, looking, would have missed it if we went home to get a camera. So, um, that might be all the, oh, most important thing. Yeah, we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. That's my son, my daughter, and my granddaughter, Allie Grace, who just got back from California yesterday. And so, and they live, Okay, and yeah, everybody can bounce here. They're like 15 feet from my house. That's their house. So we don't get too far away when, uh, with a with family deal, but um, that's the future. If they, if they want, whatever they want to do is absolutely cool with me, and they're going to have be way smarter than old dad was and all this stuff. And that's why we do it all. So I know that was kind of fast going through, and I can talk. I can talk all night, but I don't want to bore you guys and give you some time for some questions. And, and like I said, I travel all across the United States, uh, and I've, I've had that opportunity since I was a little boy. My dad put me on a bus with a lot of tours, if he could go, so I could see. Every, I've been to every state and got to see nearly all the agriculture in this country, and that it makes me a little bit different. Uh, most farmers don't have the chance to get out of their own backyard, so they tend to think that their world is with a, within a five mile radius. Um, also, we have a background in my, oh, my back surgery, so I went back to school and, and uh, did some medical stuff and managed a medical clinic for five years. So, that, that input from the, the urban people really helped change my operation. Too. So, is that in my Yeah. Yeah, I went to radiology, went through that course first, and uh, finished that, and then my back was out again, and I couldn't position patients. So I went back and got a, an administrative type degree and, so I could manage a medical clinic and do stuff like that. I like numbers, so. Any questions? So were you, uh, I, I'm Lynn. God bless you. Uh, so, are you you're growing uh, grasses and legumes, both uh, warm season and cool season? Yes. So, most of our pastures were brown. They were they were cool season grasses, and then we started to to do a process called biocarpeting a few years ago, where we were using a, a bale processor, bale and roller bringing in bales of hay that had different seeds. So we fed a lot of warm season bales on brome pastures. And of course they, they ate what they wanted when we were here and they tromped in the rest of the seed was there. We built the soil as we went down the hill. Uh, we've overseeded a lot uh, with clovers too now. Uh, 
With all that being said, the, the best thing for your buck is raising cover crops year round. So in our operation, every third year of the field is in corn or soybeans or something, get some cover crops and get the cattle across it. And then we nearly eliminate our, our fertilizer input. Synthetic fertilizers are extremely harmful on the soil. Tillage is the worst thing you can do to the soil. Um, but when you start no-tilling and adding the cover crops and bringing the cattle in, you can see to the right to the line where you really maximize you know, the grazing with those nutrients. So, um, like I said, you know, God made the perfect fertilizing machine and made all the crops and all the all the different things and totally messed it up. So. I did anything. What was wrong? Rome, it's, it's, it's a cool season grass. So, pretty, uh, yeah, it's every place in eastern Nebraska. But a few of you guys got to see where we've done some of this biocarpeting and uh, well, Bobby camped over there the other night and, and got to see this native prairie now that's back and it's that tall. You know? So, it's, it's cool to see another process we use now because the bale, the biocarbing bale, feeding the bale was, was too expensive. It was every day, it took too much power, too, too much fuel. Um, so now we went to bale grazing where we strategically set bales out on the poor soil spots and uh, fence around it and let cows in as they eat them. And then they eat what they want and chomp the rest in. And uh, some spots we had last spring where we bale grazed, uh, where we took the soil samples, we were around 4.62 tons per acre where the bale set. And right next to where there wasn't any, it was like 1.60 tons. That's just setting a bale out for the cows doing what they want. So I want it to be as easy and as in sync with nature as you can be. So you call that bale, bale raised? Bale grazing. Oh, yeah, and it's, they used to do it in Canada a lot, now it's caught on down here, and, and uh, it's, there's a few things, that's one of the fastest ways to make money, you know, or save money on the place, and if you need different nutrients in your soil, you just bring hay in from other areas, and then that brings different nutrients in, different seeds, you know, we'll let a lot of our alfalfa and red clover get a seed before we put it up in bales, so that the translocation of the seed to the next place. Because you know, you start buying warm season grass seed and legume seed, it's super expensive. So a fifty dollar bale that you're getting the fertilizer and the cow feed and the seed, all of a sudden you're making money every bale out there. Mm -hmm. What are some of the benefits of us uh, geographically here in Oklahoma? As one of the primary concerns of our jurisdiction is uh, the high iron content in our soil, how can we offset that by using your uh, non-invasive minimum impact method of going about cropping more using the agriculture uh, in our benefit? Like how can we, like push versus pull, like cattle versus bison, what would you say would be more beneficial? Either one. From a tradition standpoint, the bison would be a cool sell, you know. Um, bison, their hosts are a little different than, than the cows, but that's the, that's the only thing, because they're still producing about the same amount of manure and urine. So that's how you start taking that out of your soil. You start planting cover crops that are going to pull some of that out and put different nutrients back in there, and then the animal impact coming across there. Because, you know, you guys, a lot of you guys remember when this country down here and going through Kansas was or wheat, wheat cattle country. When I was a kid, my dad bought feeder cattle all over, and we'd come down into these, you know, Kansas and Oklahoma, and there was thousands of cattle on, on wheat. Well, A, no one wants to mess with cattle, because, you know, it, it takes some work, and they have to get off their tractor seat, and they're gonna hate that. But, you know, when they did stop doing that, well then they replaced all the nutrients that they were getting put on there, plus what the wheat was doing to benefit the soil, you know, with synth synthetic fertilizers. So that finished depleting it out and, and uh, 
made the problems and deficiencies of what you guys have in your in excess more pronounced. So back to get it balanced. The, the best tool in agriculture now, you know these guys are getting it if, if they walk over and get a spade out of their truck when they come to visit. You dig in the soil. You see if there's life. Is there earthworms? What color is it? Does it smell good? If they're not carrying a spade around in their trunk, they're, they're not even getting close to figuring out that they need to be what they need to be doing. So, you know, you've seen me dig all the time. Everybody sees me dig around. That's a, you know, we have groups come to, to see what we're doing, and I'm like off, like, you know, 100 feet away digging in my spade. Yeah, it's pulling out macro vertebrates, ribbon testing. And it's beautiful. It's a rush. So every soil can be reclaimed. Uh, you know, deserts can be reclaimed now with animal impact and the right uh, crops and, and the right techniques for other plant and harvesting. So, uh, but we have to stop doing those harmful things that we're doing, and that's your your friend, my friends that are trying to sell you all those products, tell that you put up and all that stuff. You know, so uh, it's a common sense approach. My theory for me is to keep it simple, stupid, because it's too complex. I'm not, I don't want to know about it. I just want to do what feels good. Mm -hmm. Yes, Deb? Hey, Dale, you brought down some, uh, or, or gave us some uh, seeds to play with. Can you tell us a little bit about those seeds and what kind of steps we could take? The best part about cover crops is the only make, mistake you can make is not planting them. So we get calls every day. Oh gosh, what do we need? What do we need to be doing? Should we not be doing this? Should we get a new piece of equipment to plant this? And they, they talk themselves out of actually doing it and they make it complicated. So the first step is just planting whatever you have. But your mix, Deb, is we're gonna to try to pull some of that extra, those extra things out of your soil and start getting a rebound on the things that need to be in there. So, Oh, your mix has 10 or 12 different things in it. Um, there's hairy vetch, there's cow peas, rye, oats, forage, sorghum. Um, there's some clovers in there. It's, it's really going to fix a lot of nutrients and it's going to get pretty tall so you can let it you know, mature and then push it down, break it over, however you guys want to do it and plant right into it. But you're going to see a difference in the first year gardens just starting to use that. Oh, you, you suggest putting that in the gardens? Yeah. Okay. yeah. As soon as you guys aren't going in there. Uh, so we're doing quite a bit of cover crop work at the Perkins Research Station, so okay. still are. Uh, it's not unusual for production soils within this state to have organic matter levels of a half of a percent, seven tenths of a percent. Yeah. And you know what we've seen is we've been gaining about a quarter of a percent per year. We, we don't, and I'm a horticulturist, so I'm not an animal guy. So but just with straight cover crops, that's the result you're getting. Cover crops. So if you put an, animal impact on top of that, you're going to double or triple that every year. Yeah. But I'm just trying to get my head wrapped around how I might work that out. Yeah. But you're still, either way, you're still improving it. Right. Now, you have to put that from, from an economic base deal for the farmer. Right. So they come to my place and they're like, yeah, you're not making any money off of this or whatever. I'm like, yeah, here's, here's the figures, you know. Last year when everybody else was losing money on corn, we were netting three to four hundred dollars per acre. On, on the same type of corn, but planted behind cover crops and grazing. So, you know, I don't want to pay the fertilizer guy. I don't want to do, I like my fertilizer to be going year round, even on Christmas Day. I can look out and I'm like, oh, they're still fertilizing. You know, so it's, it's hard to beat that machine. You know? But it's, it's a big issue. And part of our problem, you, you have a, and I'm not, I'm not uh, saying what you're doing is, is great, okay? But it's a little easier for you because you're in a colder climate. Mm -hmm. you know, when we're in a warmer climate, 
our bacteria, fungi, whatever, break down stuff almost all out of here. Right. And so you, I always tell people this, this is, how those critters in the ground in Nebraska and on North America, I says, go to Disney World, they go to Europe during the winter time, they have fun, and ours just work. Maybe they'll make one shot, a coffee shop or something, but they don't get you to spend days off. But that's all the, all the more reason to have something growing. Absolutely. It's got to be growing year round because a lot of our stuff doesn't winter kill anymore. We have such a dense, it's such a thick cover that the, the top is keeping it from freezing, and you can do, you can put a spade in the ground in January. You know. But we also, when you get that organic matter up to that 7%, you know, the people that are anti-no-till, they're like, well, I can't get through all that trash. When you get your soil balanced, you can't keep the trash there. The earthworms, everything, are pulling it down so fast. So, I mean, we have to have such, and around, you know, around this pond, even this year, it's 12 or 15 feet tall. We need that much. The cows will graze it a little bit, they'll trap the rest, and we have the soil armor. We've got to have a 15 foot tall plant in that deal to even feed to keep enough, you know, cover on it. Because where we planted this corn, it was planted in super tall stuff. And looking at the ground now, you would think we had worked it. There's no residue on top. I told Bobby the other day, I said, looks, looks like you worked it here. It's just, and that's that's alarming because, you know, that you want to keep it covered. But it's not as alarming as when you're. Organic matters a half percent. Yeah, because you know you're doing it right. That's why it's going so fast. But, so you know we're we're using uh, forage cow feed. That's a mm -hmm. summer lagoon. and we're using a uh, uh, hay grazer, you know, sort of sedan. Right. right? Uh, we're using uh, pearl millet as a grass uh, during the summer. So that that's kind of summer, and then the winter time we're using winter wheat and. and uh, Cereal rye, sure. With with different materials, yeah. uh, Austrian winter pea, uh, crimson clover. I love crimson clover. Uh, it's so pretty in the spring. I mean, it's just like knock your eyes. And, and that's it. so you yeah. get it a hundred percent. So look at the beauty of the of those crops first. These guys got to see when they picked corn last night. My sun hams ten feet tall because we're let we let it mature. So the top of the field comes through all this forage and it's all yellow flowers, and it just smells beautiful in there. You know, if you can't even stop and appreciate that, I mean, that's the biggest advantage of all, you know, of all of it. You know, just looking at it and smelling it. And, but you're right. Gosh, if somebody would have told me 10 years ago, I was walking around looking at every little plant coming up and doing all this. I was a farmer. I didn't do that, you know? Now I'm on my hands and knees. It's like, oh my gosh, my, my phone has like 20,000 pictures of every different yeah. plant that come up. And so, but I hear what you're saying. But, yeah, I think, I mean, through my career, and I'm, I'm you know, getting further along in it, but the further along I get, the more I realize that what really matters is soil health. If, if we can get the soil right, we can make lots of mistakes with everything. We can change the entire. It'll still work out. Right. But if the soil's wrong, we can spend lots of money, lots of effort, lots of time, and still belly flop. So and that's just the way we do it. Not just from an agriculture standpoint, but from a society standpoint. Yeah. I've got to see of working with communities that when you start planting all these empty lots to gardens, and these kids come out of the house to work in the gardens, they're touching the soil. I firmly believe if everyone's touching the soil, it, it sparks a revolution and the whole, everything gets better. You know, unemployment rate goes down because everyone's doing something. Abuse of every form goes down. Everybody has that, that, that feeling of, um, you know, that they're actually doing something. They're contributing. And we all came from that, you know, and in government and, or, and all these other things changed us and, and, and pitted us against each other. And, you know, just if everyone was doing their deal, you know, every, everything should be sustainable and can be. You know, you don't need that many acres to raise a lot of food for a town. 
and especially down here with your, with your weather. So. One thing I noticed uh, as we, we left your ranch is, you know how you talked about all the other farmers and uh, croppers around your area, they weren't making any money, and I didn't see how you were, you know, but then as I leave your, your property, I see, you know, thousands and hundreds of thousand dollars worth of sprayers to water, you know, these crops that just move, 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 you know, it's because, is that because they did the, the tilling and then, you know, pushed it down and now they need more water, where you, I mean, I don't know if you ever mentioned, you have $150 worth of garden hose that you use for a pretty substantial amount of acreage and it's just minimal yeah. water. Well, they I didn't start out with, I didn't have any water underneath me, and they did. But the yeah, B to that whole equation is, so University of Nebraska says that you can raise 200 bushel of corn in my country with 24 inches of water. I get 32 at my place. They get 32 west of me. So their tillage, there's such a hard, they call it a plow pan, it's so hard underneath there that the water won't run in. So these guys, they get the latest and greatest piece of equipment sold to them $100,000 turbo till something, it's going to make the perfect seed bed. No, God made the perfect seed bed. It, and he didn't call it turbo till, I don't think. But I don't know every you know, verse in the Bible either, but potentially. So, um, so they create this thinking they're doing the right thing, thinking they're doing the right thing, not just from a, a, a method standpoint, but from we're doing the right thing in the eyes of our neighbors. Well, if you're cutting edge, you're not doing any of that. You're, you're not, I mean, you know, we're not buying a lot of equipment. So they developed this plow pan, this hard pan. So instead of them no-tilling and cover crops, even leaving the cattle out of the equation, you know, they, they don't need any extra water than what, it, what they're getting in rain. But they'll put on 14 inches of water to try to raise that crop, and most of it pools or goes into the ditch. But they just, the water's never going to run out if you ask them. Now, the places I've been in this country, Texas, New Mexico, I think the pivots growing up in weeds and being cut up might indicate that they're, they don't have water anymore, but, you know, the, the farmer doesn't get out to see that like, like I do. But, so, yeah, their life could be so much better, Bobby. I mean, just so much better. And, you know, but their biggest fear is they don't, what are they going to do with all their time? Well, go see that, you know, go see your kid's baseball game. You don't even know your son, you know. Um, read, fish, hunt, go on vacation. Well, I mean, it's scared, they're scared to death. I, I consulted, for, consulted for a big egg operation in Illinois because their banker called me. They were going broke. And I drove in the place the day before I got there, they got six new John Deere tractors delivered. Six. They were all lined up. One for everybody to do something with. And they're like, so you're here from the bank, you're going to help us? I'm like, yeah, I'm going to sell four of those John Deere tractors tomorrow. So how many grain cars do you have? Two. I said, you got a, a planter and a drill? Yep. I said, those are the same two tractors that run those. These other four are getting sold. I don't care if you lose $100,000 a piece on them. We're saving that money right off the top. Well, what's... Ricky or whatever their son. What's he gonna do? All he's ever done is tilled. I'm like, I don't know, read a book or something, you know, it's gonna be a whole different deal. But they they didn't know what they were gonna do. Because they were gonna have all this time and it scared them. It scared them to death. That's pretty weird. You know, I just I don't have a lot of time to do ridiculous stuff. I mean all kinds of trouble. It's my goal. I, I kind of wonder something, though. I mean, I grew up broadly in farming, South Central Kansas. And as all these aquifers from all the water out is gone, I, I, I just don't see how we're going to do it besides broadly farming. I mean, it's going to be broadly farming, and it's going to be how we retain that water. You know, as, as a vegetable guy, we're going we're gonna to have to irrigate some of them a little bit. Absolutely, but you're actually raising something we eat. 
Look at all the crops we're raising. Yeah. In Nebraska, 77% 70, of the corn goes to feed or fuel. 77% goes to animals that don't, that weren't even developed to eat grain. And fuel for a clean, renewable train wreck of the ethanol program. You know? And so, yeah. So Milo, you know, sorghum. We planted all sorghum until the crop insurance deal came through. Well, we could make more money planting dry land corn and letting it burn up than, than just raising Milo. But it's all going to come to that. It's going to be, these guys are going to be raising, it's, there's going to be more rotation to hold that water and all that stuff. And they're going to raise different crops and they're going to complain about it. They're still going to be farming. You know? No, that water is running out. It's not. You know, these guys that say, no, it's been, it's been rising in my place every year. Well, maybe in your spot it has, but I um, talked to a water specialist in Texas when I was there last summer. He said one irrigated pivot of corn in a season, 134 acres, takes the equivalent in water of four days worth of pumping for the city of Amarillo. That's a lot of ridiculous waste of water. You know? That doesn't make sense. I no one wants to thirst to that. That'd be a horrible way to go, but you know. But back to the civilizations that have rose and fallen. Egypt, Libya, Syria, every place, they were fertile, fertile, you know, lands. Water and soil, gone. So but no one reads history. I did a speech at the University of Nebraska last week, and my first slide was a, a, this Jefferson Davis statue in Richmond, Virginia, that they took down. We were just there last winter. I wanted my daughter to see it. She's a huge history person, too. And I said, you need to see all this before they take it down. Wow, I had no idea they were going to take it down that fast. But I started my slide with it, and I said, history, study it, everything about it. If you don't know history, you know, we're, 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 we're doomed to repeat it. And we continue to do that because no one studies history. Not just ag history, but history in general. History about wars, history about innovation, everything. And so it's, it's a whole uh, reprogramming of our society, you know. And in, in farming, we deal with a lot of adult children. People that are 60 years old that shouldn't be running anything. And they've got how many generations with them. So, you know, they're not making good decisions. They're making decisions based on what the government used to pay them and things like that. Yeah. So, and that, those days are done now. They're done forever on that direct thing. It'd be only hope they change some stuff around so small operations can actually benefit. Because that's what they're all, you know, the New Deal is where that all came out of. And that was set up to be a temporary fix to get these guys going, and we created a, like the government does with everything, as you guys well know, just a cluster. And I cleaned that up, I mean, anything. So, anything else I know we probably went way over time. Could you just say it again, you said you had 7,000 acres? What, what were a couple of things that caused you to shift in that, that big of a production? Uh, the, 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 I hated it. I was a cow guy, but I had the opportunity to rent a bunch of ground, and I thought that was the only way to do it, like a lot of these guys still think. Then I have my back problems, and my doctor said, if you get back in tractor, you will be paralyzed in a wheelchair by the time you're 40. That's like pretty, like, not wanting that to happen. So, but, <laughs> but I didn't listen the first time. After the first surgery, I got, within a week, I got back in a combine, and combine 5,000 acres a week. And they carried me back to get my next and slow burner. So. <laughs> so. But I'm not a quitter. Yeah. So I think you can teach the rest of us on a smaller scale approach. Yeah, it's just you know, my son, he's twenty five, he wouldn't farm to save his soul. He was in that buddy seat in that combine with me or tractor. He hates it. He loves the cows, but he hates farming. That's all he remembers is we were on the road. He never got to see his dad, you know, and, and I, that, that's a horrible thing to, to do to your kids. Like, thank goodness I've got time to make that right with him. And 
when we were doing all that and switched to no-till, well, then I started coaching his baseball team and we went fishing again because we weren't tilling. We had all this time. I mean, we were, we were looking for more ground, so we were just sitting around waiting. You know, so. Anything else? Thank I can you. talk to you after. Let's, let's call it.